stand. Can we do that? Let's stand. I want to share some scriptures with you from the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2. I want to share with you verse 4 and 5. Look what the Bible says. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. You know what that tells me? You can leave your first love. You can leave your first love. He said, I have somewhat against thee because you've left your first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent, look, and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and I will remove the golden candlestick out of the place except thou repent. Let us pray. Lord, today I ask you to speak to us and through us. I ask you today to have your will and way in this service. And God, for all you do, we're just going to praise you. We just want to praise you and exalt you and magnify your name. For I pray this, Christ, this prayer in Christ's name until you come. Amen. You may be seated. I want to take just a little while and I want to talk to you about the importance of chairs. The importance of chairs. Early on in my life, I learned about the importance of chairs at, at our dinner table when I was growing up. I was raised by a stepfather, and I knew unequivocally at the head of the table was his chair. I never, it never crossed my mind one time I think I'll sit in that chair. It just never crossed my mind. I was, I was some dumb, but I wasn't plum dumb. Amen? Uh, it never crossed my mind to do that. I learned early on about the importance of chairs. Then when I started playing basketball, I learned about the importance of chairs. I started about the importance of chairs playing basketball because this is what I learned. When the, when the starting five went on to the court, it was important where I was sitting because what I've learned that those, were set, those that were sitting close to the coach were more out to go in quickly. He had them sitting there because they would go into the game and they would get playing time quickly. So wherever your seat was, on the bench was very important. I learned the importance of chairs. And then when I started traveling and I started flying on airplanes, I learned quickly the importance of chairs. I, I, for many, many years, most of my seats were back right by the toilet. Amen? I mean, literally, I almost could have been in the toilet. I was leaned up against the toilet many, many times. But let me tell you something. There has been a few times that I was able to sit up front. And let me tell you something, there, if you've never sat up front, there's a big difference in sitting up front and sitting next to the toilet, amen? I learned from airplanes about the importance of chairs. It really makes a difference where you sit. I remember years ago, Cameron and I, my brother and a man from our church, I bought four tickets to the Atlanta Hawks basketball game. They were in the nosebleed section, and I had those four tickets, and we were walking into the game, and the businessman who was with me said, let me see those tickets, and I handed them to him. He looked at those tickets and saw where they were at, and he handed them back to me. And about that time, a man walked up, and he said, I want to sell you four tickets on the floor. And I said to that man, no, 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 we're not interested. And that businessman was with me. He said, oh, yes, we are. We're very interested. <laughs> He said, we're very interested in those tickets. And he pulled the cash money out of his pocket and he purchased those four tickets. And I sat right there on the floor and watched that basketball game. I'll never forget it because during that basketball game, Cameron looked over at me. And this is what he said to me. He said, Pastor Benny, this game is flying. He said, it's flying by. I said, Cameron, I know it is, but it wouldn't be going near as quickly if we were sitting right up there, son. I learned the importance of chairs, and I want to talk to you today. I want to talk to you today about three chairs. See, there's, there's this first chair right here. This first chair right here, I want you to understand this chair. It's the chair of commitment. It's the chair of commitment. What are you talking about, Pastor? I'm talking about Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let me tell you who's sitting in chair number one. I'll tell you who's sitting in chair number one. It's people that are totally committed to God. 
No, they're not about religion. They're about a relationship with Jesus Christ. He's not only their Savior, but he is their Lord. I'm telling you that, that, that church is not a possibility. Church is a priority in their life. The Bible is not a possibility. The Bible is a priority in their life. A prayer is not a possibility, but prayer is a priority in their life. They're in chair number one. They're totally sold out for God. It's Jesus. He's number one in my life. He means more to me than anything else. They're in chair number one. I sure hope you're in chair number one. But then there's another chair. It's not chair number one. It's chair number two. It's chair number two. It's compromise. Well, uh, I'm kind of straddling the fence. <laughs> well, I, I go to church. Church is a possibility, but it's not really a priority. No, no, if I'm, if I'm out late at the Georgia game, I'm just not going to make it on Sunday morning. And if I get that opportunity to go shoot Bambi on Sunday, no, I just don't go. No, and you know, it's the golf tournament, and it's two days, and it ends on Sunday, and it's really not that big a deal. I, well, I hadn't read my Bible in a while, but it's not that big an issue. Well, I'll tell you what I'm trying to do. I really don't want to take a strong stand. I just kind of have mixed emotions. I've got, I've got one foot in. I've kind of got one foot out. I, I just kind of sit in the chair of compromise. I, I'm kind of like Peter. You remember Peter was following the Lord, but the Scripture says he followed afar off. I'm kind of like Matthew 15 and 8 that says, I, I talk about it with my mouth. I talk a good game, but my heart is far from it. See, there's some people sitting in chair number one, commitment. There's people sitting in chair number two, compromise. But there's people sitting in chair number three. And chair number three is confusion. My life's just confused. My life's in disarray. I have no direction. It's chaotic. It's out of control. Things are happening. I'm, I'm, I'm in a whirlwind. Life is so confusing. Our family's so in disarray. Everything is in dysfunction. No, no, I, I'm not in chair number one. I, I'm not even in chair number two, Pastor. i got to be honest with you. I'm in chair number three. Everything is so confusing. Everything is so disarray. There's no God. There's no relationship with God. There's no talk about God. There's no Bible. Oh, church, I don't remember. We may have went Easter last year. I don't know. We may have not even went then. But everything is so in confusion. Now, here's what's amazing. If you study history... What I'm preaching to you about the three chairs will, will pan out. Let me explain. You can see the three chairs in our universities. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about in our universities? Well, the first 123 colleges that was formed in America had Christian origins. Harvard, Princeton, and Yale were Christian universities. Chapel was mandatory. And you had to sign a commitment that you would have daily devotions. But we started giving law degrees. I'm not, I'm not meaning that negative toward lawyers. Liberalism swept in. And now, folks, the major universities in America, 12%, of the professors are conservative. 88% of the professors, 88% of the leadership in the universities in America are liberal. 88% say, no, no, we have a liberal worldview. We, we, we have a liberal, we have a high tolerant worldview. We're, 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 we're very liberal when it comes to ideology, when it comes to philosophy, when it comes to everything. 90% of the major universities say, you got to understand something before you send your children. They're going to get a liberal indoctrination because that's who we are. And we look at the University of Pennsylvania. That was started by Ben Franklin. Where did it start, Pastor Benny? Where did the University of Pennsylvania start? It started in a church that was George Whitfield's church. Because Ben Franklin paid, see, to publish George Whitfield's sermons. George Whitfield and Ben Franklin had a wonderful, wonderful relationship. 
See, it was Ben Franklin who, when we were trying to agree on a constitution in Independence Hall, said, Men, we need the Father of Lights to illuminate our minds. He said, we've got to get down on our knees. Ben Franklin said, because if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without God seeing it, do we really think a nation can rise without the hand of God? That's who started the University of Pennsylvania. But the University of Pennsylvania now has a student by the name of Leah Thomas. For three years, he was on the men's swim team and did extremely well. Became transgender and joined the female swim team and won the NCAA Swimming Championship and was recently nominated <laughs> by the NCAA for Woman of the Year. We started here. We've ended up here. I want to say something. I've got to move fast. I've got more material than I've got time. But let me tell you something. We need Christian people to get involved in the political system. We need Christian people. No, 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 no. You say, well, no, no. We need, we need Christian people to get in the school boards, on the school boards, run for the school boards, run for the commission, run for state rep, run for mayor. We need godly people back in politics so we can get back to chair number one. It's in our universities, but it's in our nation. Do you, do you realize, folks, that this nation, in 1620, the pilgrims came here, and our first governing document was the Mayflower Compact. What does the Mayflower Compact say? It said that this voyage is for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. Fifty-six men signed the Declaration of Independence. Fifty-three of them were devout Christian men. They signed the Declaration of Independence on July the 2nd, 1776. But they had a day of prayer and fasting for that document on May the 17th, 1776. That document says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator, with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But ladies and gentlemen, we've decided that we want to remove God. We've removed God. And our federal prisons are at 60% over capacity. And we've got 2 million Americans in prison or in jail. Then there's the sex trafficking industry. Do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, the average age of a young lady in sex trafficking is 12 years old? Get this closely. 300 men in a day, 300 men a day in Atlanta, Georgia, will have relations with a 12-year-old girl. 300 men a day in Atlanta, Georgia, will have relations with a 12-year-old girl. Sex texting, sex texting, 40% of the sexting, sex texting is between the ages of 11 and 13. Listen, folks, I know it's illegal to walk into a facility and cry fire, fire, fire. I know it's illegal to walk into a public building and cry fire, fire, fire. But let me tell you something. If the place is on fire, somebody better cry out. And I want to report to you, it's on fire. We better have somebody that's going to have a backbone that will stand up and cry out and say, we need to get back to chair number one. It's in our universities. It's in our nations. Listen, it's in our denominations. Think about this. Most of you may not know this, but this is a Methodist church. <laughs> it's a congregational Methodist church. I know most of you don't know that, and it matters not. 
It matters not. But the Methodist denomination was started by men John and Charles Wesley and George Whitfield. They were men, John Wesley said, if a man will get on fire for God, people will come and watch him burn. John Wesley said, I'm a man of one book. They were responsible. They played a big part in the first great awakening that literally led to the abolishing of slavery. That's who these men were. But their denomination today questions the virgin birth. What John Wesley... Look here. If Jesus had preached what most preachers preach today, he never would have got crucified. Because we just got to be happy clappy. And when somebody takes a stand, we're trying to walk away from them when we ought to walk toward them and get behind them and say he's preaching the word of God and I'm going to stand with him. But John Wesley's denomination says today that marriage, they define it this way. It's between two persons. But I can't get away from Genesis 2 and 24. This says, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. I'm not going to redefine anything. We shouldn't redefine anything. God has already defined marriage as to be between one man and one woman. God has defined marriage. You say, Pastor... There's examples of chair number one to chair number three. Oh, yeah. Think about the church at Ephesus. It was started in Acts chapter 19 by the great apostle Paul. He spent three years here at the church at Ephesus. And at one time, this, chair, this church was in chair number one. If you read six chapters of the book of Ephesians, if you read six chapters of the book of Ephesians, it talks about the love that they had. He said, first of all, I've heard of the love of the saints. He said, you're rooted in love. You're, you're built in love. They were in chair number one, but wait. They left their first love. Remember? They went from chair number one to chair number two, and they left their first love. But you don't go from one to two. You go from one to two to three. Right. See, they ended up in the chair of confusion. Because not long ago, I was preaching in Ephesus, Turkey. And I said, tell me about Christianity here in Ephesus, Turkey. And they said, it's 99.9% .9 Muslim. A church that was committed on fire for God moved to chair number two and moved to chair number three. It's a church example. But not only is there a church example, there's an individual example. You've got David. The Bible tells us in Acts 13, 22, he was a man after God's own heart. It tells us in Psalms 4, 42 and 1, that as the deer painteth after the water, so I long for thee. I mean, he was, in, he was in chair number one, but all. He moved to chair number two. Samuel 11 and 1 tells us that when the kings went forth to battle, he tarried in Jerusalem. What did he do? He laid his armor down. He went from chair number one to chair number two. He got in the wrong place. He got with the wrong people. If you hang out in the barber shop, you're going to get a haircut. <laughs> he was in chair number one. He, he moved to chair number two. He tarried in Jerusalem when he should have been in the battlefield. He looked out there and he saw a woman. He had relations with that woman. Later had her husband killed. But it didn't end there. See, I don't know if you realize this, but David had a son by the name of Amnon. He raped his sister Tamar. He had another son by the name of Absalom. He killed Amnon. 
And then Absalom literally tried to overthrow his daddy. Wait. He was in chair number one. But somehow he ended up in chair number three. See, folks, it's in families. Abraham. You remember Abraham? In Genesis 12, the Bible says this about Abraham. He was in chair number one. He built an altar, and then he dug a well. But he had a son, Isaac. Isaac dug a well, and then he built an altar. What did he say? Substance is more important than the spiritual. What did he say? Sports is more important than the spiritual. What did he say? My social life is more important than the spiritual. What did he say? My sex life is more important than the spiritual. I want the spiritual, but bless God, I'm going to dig the well first. Oh, Abraham was in chair number one. Isaac ended up in chair number two. But wait, Jacob, Isaac's son, he was a deceiver. He was a liar. He was a con man. The family went from one, two, three. Now let me make some statements and we're almost done. Statement number one is this. The chair you sit in represents where you are spiritually. Oh, you said, Pastor, where, where, where we said, oh, some of you are sitting today in chair number one. You're in commitment. He's Lord of all. But, but some of you, you're not sitting in chair number one. You're sitting in chair number two. Yeah, he, he, he's just really a possibility. He's not a priority in your life. You're doing it totally what you want to do. Or oh, you'll come to church if it's convenient. But if it's inconvenient, I'm not going. No, 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 not if I got a better offer. I won't be there. No, 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 no. It, 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 I, well, I, I'm kind of I'm, I'm both ways. When I'm here, I'm here. No, 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 you're not. I, 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 I'm in chair number two. It's, it's, it's compromise. Then there's chair number three. My life's so in disarray. My life is so in disarray. Everything is so confusing. There's no direction in my life. I don't know actually what's even going to happen next in our family. You understand something? The chair you sit in represents, get this, it represents you spiritually. Number two, you get this. The chair, your chair, will impact your child. Say, Pastor, I'm going to tell you something. I'm, I'm sitting in chair number one. I'm sold out to God. I'm sold out to God. Listen to me closely. There's a high probability that your child will sit in chair number one. In the worst case scenario, chair number two. But wait. I don't sit in chair number one. I'm kind of in compromise I'm in chair number two get this if you're in chair number two your child's not going to sit in chair number one your child's going to sit in chair number three so understand something the chair that you sit in will impact your Child, You say, well, Pastor, how do I get my child in chair number one? Three simple things. Proverbs 22 and 6. Train up a child in the way they should go. When they're old, they should not depart from it. The first word I want you to see is model. Model. D.L. Moody said, children do as we say until they're 15, and then they do as we do. Model. The greatest leadership principle I ever learned was monkey see, monkey do. 
You don't teach what you don't know and you don't lead where you don't go. If you want your child to be sold out for God, you got to model it, ladies and gentlemen. You got to model it in front of those little girls. You got to model it in front of those little boys. You got to model it in front of your family. You got to model it. There's a second step it's management. Management. What are you talking about, preacher? Well, look what it says. Train up a child in the way they should go. It means the way they're bent. I know what some of you are thinking. My child's not bent. He's warped. No, no, he's bent. <laughs> he's bent. See, children are bent with different personalities. Children are bent with different gifts, different abilities, different interests. And you've got to build on the way in which they're built. I wish I had a nickel for every child that's came to me and said, I really don't want to be involved in this sport, but mom and dad push me so. Preacher Benny, I really don't enjoy it, but mom and dad push me so. Yeah, they want you to be the next Freddie Freeman when they couldn't throw the ball in the ocean themselves. And we'll sit in chair number two. We'll sit in compromise and we'll take them out of church and we'll take them everywhere for this function and that function and this activity and that sporting event. And then we'll say, but God's number one. Daddy, he wasn't Sunday when we were at the ball field. Some of you like to get up and walk out, but everybody know I'm plowing your corn. Model, management, wait, and memories. Train up a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they'll not depart from it. So, so you get it in them. You get it in them, and they can't get away from it. See, they need to have memories of playing but they need to have memories of you praying. They need to have memories of the circus, but they need to have memories of the church. They need to have memories of six flags, but they need to know something about the Christian flag. They need to have memories of the beach, but they need to have memories of going to Bible study. Amen? Now wait. Pastor? I'm in chair number three. How do I get back to chair number one? Revelation 2 5 tells us the first word is remember. You remember how it used to be when you had peace in your heart? You remember how it used to be when you lived for God? You remember how it used to be when church was a priority? You remember how it used to be when you opened your Bible? You remember how it used to be when you didn't go to this place and you didn't go to that place and you didn't want to be with those people? You remember how it used to be? You remember how it used to be when you had a, a peace within your heart? You've got to decide. You say, I remember how it used to be. And you've got to say, I'm tired of sitting in chair number three. Our life is in chaos. But I remember how it used to be, and bless God, I'm getting out of that chair. I'm getting out of that chair. I'm not staying in chair number three. And what I'm going to do, you say, Pastor, but I'm in chair number two. <laughs> what do you do? Well, it's the verse again. Remember and repent. God, I'm sorry. Listen, folks, I'm telling you, you can go from chair number three and chair number two back to chair number one. All you got to do is remember and repent. And then there's one other thing. Redo. Redo. You say, Pastor Benny, what do you mean? 
Get back to serving God. Get away from that crowd. You don't need to be with the lounge lizards down at the Crystal Pistol anyway. Get away from that crowd. Why are you trying to talk about how close you can live? Live close to Jesus. Get back in church. Get back in fellowship. Get in your Bible. Get in a life group. Serve the Lord. Live for Him. That's the only place there's peace and tranquility anyway. Make up your mind. Let me tell you something. I'm not playing around anymore. I'm going to get in chair, number one. I'm going to be sold out to God. I'm going to be committed to Him. He's going to be first in my life. I'm going to live my life in chair, number one. I sure want to. Because let me tell you, I'm a daddy. And I sure don't want Savannah in chair, number three. I don't want her life in disarray. I don't want her life in dysfunction. I want to do everything in my power to live and sit and walk and talk in chair number one.